Cool. All right. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, today, we are going to go over the topics for uh, homework three. And uh, the, the structure of this homework, there's there are two questions on chapter four about uh, two independent topics. And then the rest of the eight questions, uh, the, the other eight questions, rather, um, are going to be on the forces chapter, which is chapter five. Um, so to start, we're just going to go through the first two. And um, since we're going over all the problems today, I am going to speed it up just a little bit. Um, if you have any questions, the chat is open. Um, and I do have my headphones in as well. Um, so <clears throat> let's go ahead and get started with the first problem. Uh, in the first problem, we have a particle undergoing circular motion. Um, within circular motion, what we need to know for right now is that in order for a particle to travel in a circle, um, the acceleration has to be perpendicular to the velocity. So uh, for my specific problem, I have a particle located on the xy axis at 3.2 comma 3.2, which would be a point about there in the first quadrant. Uh, it has a velocity with a negative i hat component, so it's traveling to the left. And uh, it has a positive uh, j hat for the acceleration, which is an upward acceleration. And so a few things to know about circular motion. One is that we have an equation for the acceleration that allows a particle to travel in a circle. Uh, that's called a centripetal acceleration. And the equation is that the centripetal acceleration is equal to v squared over r. And um, V here is the, the speed or the magnitude of the velocity. R is the radius of the circle the particle travels around. The other thing um, that we need to be aware of is that the, this acceleration, centripetal acceleration, will always point toward the center of the circle that the particle is traveling along. Um, so in this problem, um, my job is to find the location of that uh, point. So if you'd like, you could sketch the circle a little bit. Uh, it's a very rough sketch. Um, and you can see that the center of the circle, of course, is going to be in whatever direction the acceleration points. So for my answer, um, in this case, so let me, let me label my point here. My point is 3, comma 3. So for my solution, since my acceleration is pointing vertically upward, the center of the circle has to be in the same x coordinate as the point that's given. And then in order to find the y coordinate, that's going to be some distance above the point um, that I'm located, uh, my particle is located at. And that distance will be the radius r. So I can solve this centripetal acceleration equation for r. And that would be v squared over the centripetal acceleration. And in this case, I am given the acceleration explicitly. Um, so I, and I also have the speed, so I could just go ahead and plug them in. Um, mine happened to be something like uh, negative 3.8 on top. That'll be squared over the acceleration, which is 12.7. And if I calculate that, I'll have that my radius is um, 1.14. And that would be in meters. Now, this isn't the answer that I need to give. Uh, of course, I need to, to give the actual location of the point. Um, the point will be located, as I said, just based on my picture, one radius above the green point 33 where the particle is located. And so for uh, my problem, I just add this radius, 1.14, to the 3, and I'll get 4.14. And that'll be the solution uh, or some, something like that for your problem. Make sure you pay attention to the direction of your acceleration vector, um, as that will tell you whether you need to add or subtract a radius. Um, so good, Nina, that's a great question. The acceleration is a y component, the velocity is an x component. The reason that uh, that is the case uh, is because you actually need an acceleration that is perpendicular to your velocity vector in order to undergo circular motion. So if the acceleration pointed in the same direction as the velocity, 
the particle would just speed up. If the acceleration pointed in the opposite direction, the particle would slow down. If the acceleration is perpendicular, then it will just turn the particle along a circle. Um, so Amber, they actually asked for the location of the center of the circle. That's the problem asked for. So I need to find the distance from the particle that we're, or the, rather the distance from the point that we're given to the center of the circle, which is in other words, the radius. And then I need to add that to the y coordinate that's given in order to answer the, the question. Okay. Um, I, uh, I had one quick question. Go ahead. What's up? Yeah. So if the velocity or if the acceleration was facing down, we would like subtract, right? Or, or vice versa. Yeah. 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 So if I were given a point, I can just do a new one. Let's say I had a point that was like somewhere over here in the second quadrant and say that's like negative uh, three comma two. And I was given that the acceleration, yeah, points downward, whatever that acceleration happens to be. That acceleration is going to point toward the center of the circle that the particle travels along, which would look something like that. And so in this case, uh, they would again share an x component just because of the direction of the acceleration. The points would have the same x component. Um, but in this case, you need to subtract out whatever the radius is. And you'd find that radius again um, using the centripetal acceleration equation. So everyone's uh, uh, directions, I, I'm not sure if the directions will, will be different for everyone's accelerations. Um, but if your acceleration happened to be in the i hat, then the particles would share a y component rather than an x component. But they, the two points will share at least one component. They won't give you a multi-dimensional velocity acceleration. Sick. All right, dope. Let's go on to problem number two. For problem number two, we have a different concept. This is a, uh, a concept that is, is a really common exam question because it's like medium difficulty. Um, and it is a boat crossing a river problem. And uh, so, Go ahead and sketch out our river. And they're going to tell us that the river here is flowing due east with a uniform speed of 2.4 meters per second. So I'm just kind of drawing like the direction that the river is flowing. This isn't, you know, a perfect physical diagram, but just to get our information down, that'll be 2.4 meters per second. And uh, in my problem, uh, those happen to be the numbers, but uh, as far as the direction goes, we're going to have a boat with a speed. And the, the basic idea with the boat crossing the river problem is that um, ideally, it, you start on like a south bank and you'd like to just sort of row your boat right across the river, right? Um, however, uh, the river itself is going to push you downstream some. So if I just oriented my boat to point directly across, then what's going to happen is the river itself will push me some ways down and I'll end up taking sort of a, a, a diagonal trajectory across the river. Um, so they'll ask different questions. They'll ask sometimes like, how would you have to point your boat? At what angle should you row against the current in order to end up directly across the river? Or they'll ask how far downstream you end up. Um, and the problem that you're gonna do on your homework, they ask for, uh, they, they give us a direction that, um, the boat will be pointed. So <clears throat> uh, in my problem, they're going to give me 31 degrees west of north. So there's your, your northward line. Let's see if we can get a better dash. And I will point my boat 31 degrees to the west. And uh, they also give me a speed. So in other words, the engine can uh, propel the boat at nine meters per second. And um, what they are going to ask, uh, it's two questions. So the first question asks for the 
uh, magnitude and direction of the boat's velocity relative to the ground. So this is part A so and B. Oh, I'm gonna mute you. Okay. Um, so in order to do that, we just uh, are going to sum the velocities. This is gonna look maybe a little new to us, but this is uh, gonna wet our feet a little bit before we get into forces. We're gonna do this a ton. So in order to find the net velocity, we just sum the velocities in the X direction and we sum the velocities in the Y direction. So in the X direction, um, we have uh, the velocity of the river itself, which is 2.4 meters per second. And that's going to the right. So we've always taken that to be positive. So we'll go ahead and put that as a positive 2.4. And then the other component will be um, a component of our boat's velocity. Our boat's velocity is at an angle, so we're gonna break it up into its X and Y components. In this case, we want the X component, which is going to be a projection along the X direction. It should point somewhere to the left. And since that's opposite the angle, we're gonna use sine. And it's also, like I said, pointing to the left, so it's negative. So we subtract, let's go and make this whole thing green. We subtract nine times the sine of 31. And um, if we go ahead and, and solve here, we should get, uh, you can plug this into your calculator and your X component will be, uh, for these numbers, 2.2, will be negative 2.2. So this will be the X component of the velocity. We also need to find a Y component of the velocity. Now, the river's current is entirely in the X direction, so there will be no Y component. Um, if you'd like for consistency, you could just put a zero in blue to indicate that the river has no Y component. And then we will have a component of the boat's velocity that is directed across the river. You'll notice that that's gonna point upward, which we're always taking to be the positive Y direction. So that'll be a plus. And then it's the magnitude of that velocity, nine times the, since we're looking for the adjacent component, times the cosine of 31. Plug this into your calculator and you would get 7.7. .7. Now the problem itself is gonna ask us not for the X and Y components, although here they are if you wanted to give them, the problem is gonna ask for the magnitude and the direction. Um, and uh, so for the magnitude, hopefully we're good now at, at finding the magnitude. Remember that the resultant magnitude of the velocity would be the square root of the X component squared plus the Y component squared. I'll leave that to you all to do. The angle um, that we need to find will be the angle from due north. So we could do this our conventional way, which is to say that the tangent of the angle is equal to the Y component over the X component. You could do that. That will give you an angle off of the, the river bank. Um, but since we need it off of the north, we could do just a little bit of geometry um, to, uh, to figure out what uh, equation to use. It's actually just gonna be a flipped um, of, of that uh, tangent theta equation. So I'll just go ahead and give that to you. The equation that you'll use just for this problem since we want a vertical angle is that theta is equal to the arc tangent of um, the well, okay. So, what I'd recommend doing is just sticking to arc tangent of v sub y over v sub x, and then um, this will give you the angle off of the positive X direction. So you'll find this 
theta. And what we need to do is turn this into an angle off of the vertical. So in order to do that, your actual answer will be to take 90 and subtract off that theta. Let me just double check that in my head real quick to make sure that'll work. Um, yeah, so that'll give you the angle answer. As I mentioned, this is a uh, an exam type topic, but this uh, is not a question that will come up in any other appreciable way as we move forward. Um, so in that light, if there are any questions about this specific problem, um, go ahead and ask them if you got any. Theta to be a negative. Um, so theta will be a uh, negative if if the um, So everyone's theta um, oh, I see. Uh, so you're saying that uh, arc tangent of yeah, so okay, so uh, here's a case where we're putting a we're plugging in a negative value on the bottom of the arc tangent, so your calculator is going to lie to you and put it in the fourth quadrant, even though it should be in the second quadrant. Um, so that's why you, you've got a, a negative there, Nina. Um, you can also just fall back to uh, doing the like geometric analysis yourself. This problem is a little bit strange because they are telling us that an angle off of the, here's, here's a, the, the situation. They're telling us that any angle that is to the east of north should be a positive angle and any angle that is to the west of north should be a negative angle. Whatever you find is going to be a vector in the second quadrant, it should be. Um, so that's gonna be some positive angle greater than 90 degrees. Um, and you just have to figure out how to turn that into the difference between north or the y-axis and your resultant vector. So for instance, if I got 101 degrees, then I'd say, okay, that means that I need to, you know, subtract 90 off. If the whole thing is 101 off the positive x-axis, then that would give me uh, 11 degrees off of the north. And then I know that that needs to be negative. So for my answer, I'd plug in negative 11. It's again, it's a little bit convoluted. Um, yeah, let's. Yeah, so uh, remember the rule for using this equation. This equation says that if you have a negative for your x component, you have to add 180. We have a negative 2.2 .2 here. So your calculator incorrectly, uh, or, or your calculator is incapable of, of ascertaining where that negative is placed, whether it's in the denominator or the numerator. Um, so your calculator just gives you the angle in the fourth quadrant, which is why you get negative 77. So uh, what you'd actually need to do is add 180 to that, and that would give you uh, positive 103. And so that would make this angle, whoops. This angle is 103 degrees. And then uh, the quick way to get your answer is to say that my answer should be theta minus that 103, which would be a negative. I'm sorry, uh, get that right. So my answer is 90 minus theta, which is 90 minus 103, which is negative 13. So I think the, the thing that's throwing people off, there's two parts, there's two places that people are getting confused right now. One of them is that when you do the inverse tangent here, you get an angle that put that is in the fourth quadrant. That's a calculator issue. 
And we know that whenever there's a negative value on the bottom of a fraction that we're taking the inverse tangent of, we have to add 180 to whatever the calculator gives us before we have a number that is physically meaningful. So your calculator is going to spit out some negative acute angle. You need to add 180 to that. Once you add 180 to that, then you can just go ahead and do 90 minus that angle to get the angle off the north. Or you can do the geometric analysis yourself to get that angle off the north um, if you're having trouble with that. Yeah, so Michael, if you did if you did theta minus 90, you'd just get, in my case, I'd get positive 13, which is like, you know, the magnitude of this angle and, and makes a little more sense. They just want us to use this sign convention for this one homework problem. It's a very annoying sign convention because it's causing everyone a ton of stress right now. Um, but that is why I just uh, sort of default here to, to just, for this one problem, find your angle from your calculator. Make sure you add 180 if your x component was negative, and then plug in that angle right here. OK, so there's a, a part B to this problem. Part B asks how long it takes to cross the river. How long, of course, is a measurement of time. You should be thinking, OK, I have some velocities. They give me a width of the river. And I need to find a time across the river. So we'll go back to old trusty kinematics. In this case, it's not even a ton of kinematics because there's no acceleration. So um, we do not know our delta x. We do know that our delta y is the width of the river. My width of the river is 280 meters. I know my velocity in the y is that 7.7 uh, .7 meters per second that I've found. And I need to find the time. And in this case, uh, again, no acceleration. So I can just go to my usual equation, delta y equals velocity times time, my constant uh, or zero acceleration equation. And I just have to plug in my values here, 280, is equal to 7.7 .7 times time. And if I solve for time, um, for my numbers, it'll be 36 seconds. The velocity here is the velocity, the y component of the velocity that we just found. So that would be. If we're back right here, it was this calculation right here gave us the y component of the velocity. And now we're just using that to do a motion problem like we've already done um, in previous chapters. All right. <clears throat> So in our next problem, uh, we're finally going to get into forces. Let me just do like a quick, quick and dirty review of. Uh, uh, no, so uh, well, Olivia, we have we have, we had to do part A and B in order to find how much of that given velocity was used to cross the river in the y direction. Because a boat is at an angle, we're not using all of that given velocity to get across the river want to find the time to get across the river, we need to figure out how much of the boat's velocity is being used to cross the river, which is only some of it. Some of it is being used to fight the current. Some of it's being used across the river. Um, okay, so here is the uh, just quick review of forces. Um, you've likely encountered this equation by now, F equals MA. F force is a push um, and uh, it, is the thing which gives a massive object acceleration. So we've had some massive objects so far in this class. We've only really been concerned about the acceleration of those massive objects. Now we're taking a, a broader perspective and saying, OK, how do I actually get an object to have an acceleration? How do I give an object an acceleration? Well, I need to apply a force. And force is a vector. Acceleration is a vector. Your mass will be, um, of course, a scalar mass. Uh, and uh, yeah, so this is uh, the equation itself. Practically, the way that we're going to be using this equation 
is we're going to be doing a lot of vector sums of several different forces. So what that will look like is typically we'll sum the forces in the x direction. And let's say a classic example, which is that we have like a box and we're applying two forces in F1. Let's put that at an angle. And say I'm applying an F1 and an F2. When I go to sum the forces in the x direction, I have to do the x components of each of these forces because this is a vector sum. So I'd have to do the F1 x component plus the F2 x component. So there's going to be sines and cosines as we do these problems. And then I'll set this equal to the mass times the acceleration in the x direction. And then I'll have a similar equation for the y. You know, it, it's identical, what I'm going to write down right now. But it'll look a little bit different because you're going to do the y component of the first force and the y component of the second force, which will be different. And that can be related to the mass times the acceleration in the y direction. I'm going to do a problem in just a second, but I'll just make a note that uh, very often your accelerations will be equal to zero. And that is a case where our uh, object is in equilibrium. And, uh, and that will make the actual calculation a little bit easier to do. Um, but let's go ahead and look at the first problem. First problem is just, just getting our feet wet. We have two forces acting on a particle. We're told the particle moves at constant velocity. They give us the velocity. They give us one of the forces. So I have two particles. I have, I have a, a force given. My force has a positive I hat, negative J hat. So here's my object, positive I hat, negative J hat. We do something like this. That would be my F1. Since I am moving at a constant velocity, what would my acceleration be? This vocabulary term sticks around. Since I'm at a constant velocity, good, 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 good. Lighten up the chat. Constant velocity tells us that the acceleration is equal to zero. Why do we care that the acceleration is equal to zero? We're doing forces now. Remember, we have force is equal to mass times acceleration. So knowing that our acceleration is zero makes calculating the forces here much easier. Um, now, on our picture, we could tell that we want our forces to cancel out. We want our acceleration to be zero. So we can sort of intuit that our second force would be up and to the left. And some people may sort of see the direction that we're going here, which is that we're given force one. Force two just needs to be the opposite of it. But for the sake of doing a, a force summing and, and seeing how it works, and in case there's anyone who doesn't see the intuitive approach there, all I need to do is sum my forces in the x direction. I have the x component of force 1. My x component of force 1, I'm reading off the problem, is 2.79. And then I have plus the x component of force 2. I set that equal to MA. However, I know that my acceleration is zero in this problem. So I would set this equal to zero. Now I have an equation here with two sides that allows me to solve for the x component of F2. It's a very simple case of just subtracting the 2.79 from both sides, but just so you can see how it's done, because it's going to get a little hairier in a minute. I would subtract it and get a negative 2.79 newtons. <clears throat> the units for force are newtons, named after Isaac Newton. Uh, it's a kilogram meter per second squared. And then I uh, can do, again, the summation of the forces in the y direction. I'd have the y component of force 1, which for me is negative 6.78 plus the y component of force 2. Acceleration is still 0, so we set it equal to 0. Solve for the y component of force 2, and we'll have a positive 6.78 newtons. This problem is mostly conceptual and gets us used to the idea of equilibrium and forces canceling each other out. The next problem. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, Michael, there you go. Is that, oh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Michael. Sorry. Cool. Um, all right, so the next problem, we're going to actually put this uh, uh, equilibrium idea and summing the forces into practice. So we have uh, three forces that are being applied, FA uh, and FC and, uh, and FB. So we're given the magnitude of A and the magnitude of C. We are not given the angle for uh, C. And Uh, right, okay, so we're not given the angle of C, we're not given the force B. So you have the picture given to you explicitly, but just to sketch it out here, mine will look a little bit differently, a little bit different. So here's force A, uh, force B. We know the angle, the angle will be different for everyone. Mine is uh, 146. So the directions here are um, absolute. The magnitude is only given for force A. For me, it's 211. Oh, no. Why is it not? Uh... If it, give me one second, I need to reset the whiteboard here. Okay, so I have uh, I need a little more space. I have FA, FB, my angle. 142, 146 degrees. Um, and I'm given the magnitude of force A is 211 Newtons. I am not given the magnitude of force B. Um, I'm actually going to be solving for that. I am given the magnitude of force C, but not its angle. So let's go ahead and sketch force C. The angle is unknown, but I do know that the magnitude is, uh, for me, 179 newtons. Okay, so I have uh, two fundamental things here that are unknown. The angle of the C force and the magnitude of the B force. Um, so, uh, luckily, I do know that the B force will be uh, oriented directly downward. So it will be all Y component. There will be no X component. We'll see what that looks like in just a second. Um, and I do know the angle of A by virtue of knowing that B is directed downward. Now, I uh, am going to be tasked with solving for the angle of force C. And uh, they give me two possible angles uh, and they're a little vague on exactly how that comes about it basically just means that that c vector could be either sort of at this angle or at this angle each of those angles would give a different magnitude um but we'll we'll just be very uh particular very precise with our math as we go through this and the answer will fall out um so let's go ahead and get to work we know that we're going to attack this problem by summing forces in the x and the y. Each vector will have, say, an x component and a y component. So we could say, whoops, uh, sort of explicitly, we want to do the, the x component of force A plus the x component of force B plus the x component of force C. And we're going to do this. We're going to sum it, of course, that it equal to MA. 
the x component of the acceleration. This happens to be another case where we want to hold this tire in place. So in other words, we don't want it to move. We want it to remain stationary. We want the acceleration to be zero. So the right-hand side there, we can set equal to zero. That should be a zero, very ugly zero. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and talk about the components of each of these. Uh, the angle of A is given off the downward Y direction. Um, I trust that you can do the, the uh, analysis here to get the angle off of the positive X axis. It would be like 270 minus 146. So perhaps I should sketch that somewhere. Um, 270 minus 146 would give me 124. That's, yeah, 124 degrees. Okay. Um, and so long as my angles are off the positive x-axis, I can use cosine for x, sine for y. It's going to make my job a little bit easier. So let's go ahead and write down all of our force components. For the A force, we will have my magnitude of my force, which is 211, plus the cos or times, rather, the cosine of the angle, which I just said is 124. This is the type of process you have to do over and over and over. You take the total magnitude of the force, 211, the x component will be the cosine of the angle off the positive x-axis. If I stick to the positive x-axis, then I don't need to worry too much about when to use sine, when to use cosine. I just do cosine is x, sine is y. The uh, x component of the b force, I mentioned that the force b is all in the downward y direction. It has no x component. So we can do 0. If you really, really, really want to check it, you can plug into your calculator what cosine of uh, negative 90 would be, and that'll tell you that it is in fact zero. Plus the x component of the C force, I know the magnitude of my C force is 179 newtons, and I know it's going to be cosine. Cosine of what? I don't know. So we'll go ahead and call that theta. And as I mentioned, that should be set equal to zero. If I, I believe that'll give me, um, yeah, so Michael, the reason why I subtracted from 270 is just because the angle given in this problem, for whatever reason, this 146 is given off of the, the downward y direction, because that's the direction that the B force is, is applied. Um, you don't just strictly have to do, have to do 270 minus 146, you could uh, work with the angles some other way to get there. That was just the, the quickest and shortest way to get there. Um, Okay, so uh, yeah, okay, so uh, go ahead and solve for theta. You'll notice it's the only unknown here. And if I solve for theta in my, uh, using my values, I'll get 48.8 degrees. Um, Lauren, so you'll use cosine for the x forces, sine for the y forces always. So let's go ahead and do the, the y summation. When I sum the forces in the y direction, I'll have the y component of A plus the y component of B plus the y component of C. And that'll be equal to m times the acceleration in the y direction. And uh, once again, I'm in equilibrium, so my acceleration is zero. The right hand of my equation will be equal to zero. Go ahead and do uh, the y components here. For the y components, so long as my angles are measured off the positive x-axis, my y components will just be the same as the x components, but with the sine of the angle. So rather than having 211 cosine 124, 
for the uh, component of force A, I'll have 211 sine 124. Um, you should not have to uh, hmm. give me just a second, Nina, and I'll, I'll go over, uh, explicitly what the, what you should plug into your calculator here. Um, okay. So let's see. So we have the, the Y component of force A, the Y component of force B will just be uh, the actual um, value of force B, which is what we're looking for. It'll be the magnitude of force B. And then the Y component of force C is 179 sine of theta. And again, this is equal to zero. Now we have uh two values uh we know theta we just found theta from the x component um and uh that angle theta uh could be based on our calculation that we've done above it could be positive or negative so i i, I drew i sketched it a little bit and showed how that force c could either be applied at a the angle that I have it drawn here, which is above the x-axis, or it could be at an angle below the x-axis. So uh, there are a couple of ways of getting to this plus or minus. Um, you could say that the angle theta would be positive or negative 48.8, or you can say that the y component of force C would be positive or negative. Um, either way, people are gonna have a ton of questions about exactly how I did it. So I'm just going to write down explicitly here that we can solve for force B and that we can explicitly say that the y component of force C is positive or negative because force C will either be up and to the right or down and to the right. So solving this equation will give us that force B is equal to 211 sine 124 plus or minus, it'll be negative 211 um, sine 124 plus or minus 179 times the sine of the angle theta that we just found to be 48.8. And I've run a bit out of room, but the values that I'll get out here for FB with my numbers would be either 310 newtons, if I take the plus, or 40.3 newtons, if I take the negative. Um, I, the negative sign came from the algebra that I'm doing here. I need to isolate force B right here, which means that I need to subtract 211 sine 124 from both sides. So you end up with negative 211 sine 124. Yeah, type. Um, there's a question about, and, uh, you're gonna get a value much larger than the angle should be. Nina, what value did you get for the angle? I think you're talking up here at this step. So, um, oh, uh, hold on one sec. Yeah, okay, so they, they're taking an angle off of, oh, it should have been 48. You got one, two different values. Okay, so let me do the the algebra there explicitly. I have 211 cosine of 124. Uh, plus the zero term plus 179 cosine theta. is equal to zero. So I need to subtract 211 cosine 124 from both sides. So I have 179 cosine theta 
is equal to 211 cosine 124. Divide both sides by 179. So I have cosine theta is equal to 211 cosine 124 over 179. And then take the arc cosine of both sides. And that'll give you theta is equal to the inverse cosine of 211 times the cosine of 124 over 179. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, there, there should be a negative up there. So it's a negative and then the 211 cosine 124 uh, is itself negative, so those negatives will cancel out. Um, the actual solution to this arc cosine is, and hopefully this answers Brian's question as well, the actual solution here is plus or minus. 48.8 degrees. That's the technical mathematical answer. And so that's when you plug this value in then for theta uh, in this equation right here, when we plug that value in for theta into the 179 sine of theta, we have to plug in both the positive and the negative value. So we can just do the positive and put the plus or minus out in front. That's what I've done here. Um, but that might have thrown you off a little bit there. Uh, but you can also just do one calculation where it's positive 48.8 and one where it's negative 48.8. Yes, yeah, ex that's exactly it, Brian. And that's why they ask you to, to find the answers with both. Yeah, cool. So um, of the two values that we get, how do we like know which one to pick? Um, the uh so you're giving two answers those two values that you get would be your two answers um i want to say that the larger one will go in the first box um uh more a more explicit way to know is when you plug in positive 48.8 into this the sign there the positive one should go in the first box. If you plug in negative 48.8, that should go in the second box, the answer that you get. So these values tell you that, so the, the two angles tell us that for C, in order to, to keep the tire from moving, for C could be applied either up into the right with a big magnitude of 300 newtons, a really big force, or it could be applied down and to the right with a smaller magnitude of 40 newtons. Both of those would put our uh, our tire into equilibrium. That's what these two values mean. There's two different directions, but for each direction, you have to pull with a different force in order to even out all the forces on the tire. All right. Uh, moving on to our next one, problem five. Uh, in problem five, we introduce a, a term that we need to be aware of. It's called tension. Um, tension is just a force that a rope applies to an object. So in a very basic example, I'm gonna, don't even like copy this down. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get rid of this in just a second. But if you have like an elevator, the elevator is gonna have some weight, which you could call the, the weight or the force of gravity. And that force of gravity is just going to be the mass of the object times the acceleration due to gravity. And in the upward direction with an elevator, you have uh, some stuff attached to the top of the elevator that uh, moves it up and down. But if our elevator is just stationary, then you'd have a force of tension. And the tension in the rope that's holding up the elevator has to keep the elevator in equilibrium. So it would have to be equal to the force of gravity. Um, there are some elevator problems that we'll do when it comes time to review for the exam where the elevator is moving. But this is just to introduce the concept of tension so that we can do this problem. In this problem, we have four different disks. There is a tension um, 
between each of the discs and or a rope and within each rope is a tension and um Uh, yeah, Nina, if you want to stick around, we can go over your values. Um, okay, so in problem number five, we have the the four disks. They're going to give us the, the tensions in the ropes, and they're asking us to actually find the masses of the disks. Um, so you'll notice that the tensions are largest at top, and they are the smallest at the bottom. The long and short uh, of this is to say that the each rope needs to support all of the mass beneath it. So I don't really care about the ropes that are linking each of the different masses. I just need to know what the total mass is. So for example, for tension one, which is part A, tension one is an upward force that is being applied to, to disk B, um, but it's also being applied to disk C and disk D. And uh, so just to use F equals MA, And knowing that the tension and the force of gravity here I need to cancel out, we could say that tension one is equal to the total mass. So what is the total mass going to be here? Well, it'll be the mass of B, the mass of C, and the mass of D. And so that would be mass of B plus the mass of C plus the mass of D. And the acceleration is just going to be our acceleration due to gravity G, which will just be 9.8. We can go down to the next diagram, which is uh, asking about tension two. Tension two is between B, uh, B and C. In other words, tension two just needs to support the mass of C and the mass of D times gravity. And by the same logic, going down to the next rope, tension three has to just support the mass of D times gravity. So D is actually the quickest one that we can solve. Um, this third equation. We're given the tensions. They tell us the tension for mine is 6.81. The uh, mass is what we're solving for. And we know acceleration due to gravity G. Now, a few weeks ago in discussion, I mentioned that, ex that the G that we use, negative 9.8, is negative G. So this is where I'll tell you that as we're doing force problems, whenever you see G, keep in mind that we give the directions to the forces when we sum the forces. So the constant G here is just 9.8. That's why you won't see me using G in the motion chapters, because I think that is uh, confusing when it comes to this. All right, so if I solve this for uh, the mass of particle D, of disk D. I'll get that disk D with my numbers is 0 0.695. The units are in kilograms. That's my base unit for mass. Now that I have this mass, I can plug it into the second equation, and I can solve for the mass of C. And then I can take both of them and plug them in to the equation for tension 1. The very last calculation that I'll need to do is that they tell us that the pulley itself 
applies a force of 80 newtons to the set of all four. So the force of the pulley, in other words, needs to support the mass of all four disks, MA plus MB plus MC plus MD times G. And I'll plug in, in my case, it would be 80 newtons. And then I'll plug in the three masses, which I found from the three tension equations and solve for the fourth mass. I'm gonna leave a little bit of that work to, the, to uh, each of you. But if you have any questions on that one, let me know. Okay, so the yeah, force of the pulley, we just use that that first value that they give us. Yeah, no yeah, yeah. It's okay. the force of the pulley or the force of the wall or whatever. Yeah. And then we just kind of solve it the same way we've been solving all the other ones. Yeah. So you'll start at the end, and then you'll you'll just work back through these equations. Um. Yeah, Emma. So, uh, the point here is that we want to start with the tension T3 uh, equation because that has the only one unknown. We just uh, we can just directly find the mass of disk D using the tension three equation. Once we find the mass of disk D, we plug that into the tension two equation, and now we can find the mass of disk C. Then once we have both of those, we plug them into the tension one equation. We know these two, so we can find the mass of B. And then once we have B, C, and D, we can take all three of them and plug them in right here. And then we can solve for mass A. So we kind of have to work backwards and start by doing part D in the problem and then part C and then part B and then part A. And Olivia, and I know that I'll have to answer this question again, G, is a positive constant, it's equal to positive 9.8. Whenever you see G, that is equal to positive 9.8. G is not a vector, it doesn't have a negative value. We do need to worry about up and down directions and the positive and negative that is associated with them when we are dealing with the force of gravity. But when we do that, we'll put a negative out in front of M times G. So uh, we're actually about to do that in the next problem. So again, G is equal to positive 9.8. This is why I never, when I'm doing kinematics, I never do negative G or G equals negative 9.8 or anything. I completely stay away from little G as much as possible. Um, I might have done that at, at times this semester, but I really try not to do that for this exact reason, this exact point of confusion. Um, okay, uh, so our next problem, we have a block. It's, we're given its weight, it's on a horizontal surface, we're applying an upward force, and we want to know the uh, magnitude and direction of the force of the block on the horizontal surface. So this is introducing a new concept that we need to be aware of. This is the concept of what is called a normal force. So uh, without getting too deep into the, the general relativity, your body right now wants to fall through the floor and catapult toward the center of the earth. The only reason, that's the force of gravity. Force of gravity wants to pull you down into the middle of the earth. The only thing that's keeping that from happening is that the chair that you are sitting on is pushing back up against you. So that is why you are in equilibrium and you are not accelerating toward the center of the earth. It's because here's you, I've made you a block. Although you have a weight or a force of gravity, a force of gravity or a weight, you'll see both of those. Although you have that pulling you down in order to not accelerate, you have to have an equal and opposite force canceling that out. And that is the force normal. You'll see an N, you'll also see F sub N. And so the normal force is just any supportive force um, from a surface that is applied to a body to keep it from falling. In this problem, I'll go ahead and you just use this picture because this picture will uh, serve us for this problem. In this problem, 
another upward force is going to be applied to our block. Um, my weight, I'm told, is six newtons. And I'm also told that another upward force, for me it's 1.5 newtons, is applied to the block. They asked me to find the magnitude and direction of the force of the block on the horizontal surface. So this will be equal and opposite to the normal force, but the magnitude will be the same as the normal force. So the normal force is the force that the, that the surface applies to the block, and the block will push back with an equal and opposite force. So let's go ahead and do our summation of our forces. This is actually, we only have one dimension to consider here. Everything is up and down, so we're just do the forces in the y direction. And we will uh, have two forces upward. We have our 1.5 Newton force, and we have the normal force upward. Downward is our weight, so we subtract that, and that's the weight of six Newtons. Since I want my block to remain in equilibrium, my MA, my A is zero, my MA is zero, the sum of my forces is zero. If I solve this, I'll get that the normal force, the magnitude of the normal force is 4.5 Newtons. This is a positive from my calculation, which tells me that the normal force is in fact acting upward. Now, as far as the direction, I know that the surface applies my normal force to the block. That means that the block has to apply an equal but opposite force of the block force down onto the table. So this is my magnitude for the normal force. If I specifically want to find the direction of the block on the surface, the block is still pushing down on the surface. So the direction will be down. All right, so we've introduced all of the forces we now need to do the more complicated force problem. We'll have force of gravity, we'll have a normal force, we'll have a tension. For instance, on the next problem, the classic block on a, an inclined plane problem. This is a classic physics problem that everyone has to do a ton of to prove that they can do physics. You have an inclined plane, you have a block resting on it. You'll draw this picture a million times. In your homework problem, you are explicitly given a force diagram, which is very helpful. Um, uh, there is an angle theta always given of the incline itself. And we use that angle theta in order to find the components of our different vectors. One thing that I'll tell you, and something that I always stick to, I always say just stick with up, is positive y, down is negative y, right is positive x, left is negative x. This is the only situation where I will recommend to you that you should rotate your axes. So what I mean by that is the axis system that you're going to want to use will be positive x up the incline, positive y perpendicular up from the incline, so perpendicular to the incline. And the reason for that is because if we do our, uh, if we use this axis system to split up our forces, we only need to split gravity into its x and y components. If we maintain our horizontal and vertical x and y, then we have to split everything other than gravity up into x and y components. So this is going to make our life a little bit easier. Um, so when I am Attacking one of these problems, what I want to do is I want to draw out the, the force diagram. You'll see that mine is already given to me for the two situations that we're doing in this problem. In the first situation, we have a cord that is applying a tension up the incline. I know that I always have my force of gravity or my weight downward. Go ahead and use F sub G. 
well, let's use weight because that G can get confusing. So my tension up, my weight is directly downward. And then the normal force. Now the normal force, I, I maybe didn't mention this explicitly in the last problem, but the normal force is always going to be um, perpendicular to, whoop, uh, perpendicular to the um, surface or the point of contact. So in this case, or whenever you have a block on an incline, your normal force uh, will point in the, what is now our Y direction of our new coordinate system. Okay. Um, so yeah, so our, as I mentioned, they give us the components of gravity. Um, those are very important, uh, the components of the, the weight. Uh, you'll notice that the Y component uses cosine and the X component uses sine. I'm gonna write those explicitly right here. The X component of the force of gravity, I'm using W, right? So the X component of the weight is always going to be the magnitude of the weight times the sine of theta. And the Y component of the weight is always going to be the magnitude of the weight times the cosine of theta. You'll notice that unlike in previous examples where X is cosine, Y is sine, you'll notice that we switch those here. Um, this is something that you're going to want to know because it is going to save you uh, trouble and it is something that you will need to, need to use especially on quizzes and on exams and things like that. Um, all right, so uh, what, what are we actually trying to solve here? We're trying to find the tension and the normal force for the first two parts, and then we're gonna cut the cord and find the acceleration. That'll be a little bit simpler. It, it, regardless, we're gonna have to do the summation of the forces. So we can do the summation of the forces in the X direction. And the positive x direction, our positive x direction now is up the ramp. Our negative x direction is now down the ramp. Up the ramp, we have our tension T. Down the ramp, we have just the, you'll notice the weight is going to pull you down the ramp. If you think about this just physically, if I were to put a ball or something on a ramp, I would expect the weight to pull the ball down the ramp. So our uh, weight is going to be pulling down the ramp down the ramp now in this system down the ramp is negative x so i need to subtract the x component of the weight as i've written it right here w times the sine of theta and since we are in equilibrium we're not sliding down the ramp we set this equal to zero this is what you will change for part b Yeah, so the tension is exactly, the tension is parallel to the surface. That's why we rotate our axes to set the X direction to be parallel to the surface. Um, okay. Uh, right, so this equation, solving it gives us tension is equal to the weight times the sine of theta. Now we know that our weight, our force of gravity is mg. And then we have sine of theta. We're given the mass in this problem, uh, minus 2.5. We're given the force of gravity, which is nine point, or rather, sorry, the constant acceleration due to gravity is 9.8. And then we have sine of the angle. My angle is 39 degrees. And this gives me a force of 15.4 Newtons. Uh, yes, Lauren, uh, and it, it has to do with the, the way that the angle is passed from the ramp to the force of gravity. Um, so there's a little diagram on your actual homework problem. It's labeled as like diagram C, but it's just showing you how to split up the force of gravity using the angle from the ramp. Um, I would just recommend just noting that these are for the block on the incline problem, that these will always be your components of your weight for the X and the Y and the block on the incline problem. Um, that would be my recommendation. Um, okay, so cool. The uh, right, so the x component just right away gave us the answer to part A. For part B, we want to find the normal force. For that, you may be able to surmise we're going to do the sum of the forces in the y direction. In the y direction, I will have the normal force, which is all applied 
in our new positive y direction perpendicular to the plane. So that will be the normal force up. And then I need to subtract the only other y force that we have is just the y component of the weight. You'll see that that pulls us downward into the ramp. So that would be this component right here, w cosine theta. So I subtract w cosine theta. And again, we're in equilibrium in the y direction as well. So we set the whole thing equal to zero. Solving this gives us n is equal to w cosine theta, which is mg cosine theta. And we know our mass is 2.5, g is 9.8, and we have cosine of 39. For these numbers, this will give you 19.1 newtons. The last part, part B, asks us to cut the cord. And when we cut the cord, what's going to happen is the tension is going to go away. And when the tension goes away, that means that when we sum the force in the x direction, we have no tension. We'll just have w sine theta. But on the other side, rather than being in equilibrium, this block is going to want to accelerate down the ramp. So this will actually be equal to m a, the acceleration down the ramp, and that's the thing that we actually want to find. So using this equation, I can say that negative w sine theta is equal to ma, be negative mg sine of theta is equal to ma, my m's cancel, and I'll get that the acceleration is equal to negative g sine theta, which is negative 9.8 times the sine of 39. If I plug this in, I get negative 6.17 meters per second squared. The problem asks just for the magnitude of a block's acceleration, so you would put the positive value in the answer box. Uh, what I would just point out is that our negative does give us some information. It tells us that the acceleration is in the negative x direction, which for us is down the ramp. So it does give you some information. You probably could have guessed that. The one other thing that I'll point out is that the mass is not involved in this equation. Uh, the mass does not matter for determining the acceleration down the ramp. It's just like a fun fact. I would still recommend doing the calculation every time just to make sure you're doing it correctly. Do we have any questions on this problem? Um, well, so the block is going, to, if I if I remove the tension, then I can tell that the block is going to accelerate just down the ramp, right? And down the ramp is the x direction. The x direction is parallel to the ramp. The y direction is perpendicular to the ramp. I could do the y component if I want. However, the block is not accelerating the y component. So, and, and there's no tension removed from this equation. So this relationship isn't going to change and I'm not going to get a different answer. And I also still won't find an acceleration because there's no acceleration there. So you, you would only gain acceleration in the x direction. Yeah, cool, okay. Um, all right. Uh, so next problem, problem number eight. We have a firefighter, he's got a weight, he's sliding down a pole with an acceleration downward. And uh, we wanna find the magnitude direction of the force from the pole on the firefighter and on the pole from the firefighter. So those are going to be equal and opposite forces. Um, we just need to make sure that they are opposing. Um, let's do the force calculation. We have our firefighter. He's got a weight down. They tell us it's 655 newtons. 
and um, we're also told that he has an acceleration downward. My acceleration downward is 3.06 meters per second squared. So yeah, that might seem like a lot, but 655 Newtons is what mass times 9.8. So you like roughly divide by 10. It's only 60, maybe like maybe 70 kilograms, which I think is like 150 pounds. I, I have no idea how to go from kilograms to pounds. Uh, oh, this, this, yes, I can only draw squares. I only ever draw squares. Never ask for anything better from me. Uh, all right, so this this firefighter would obviously just drop uh, with an acceleration due to gravity. The reason he's only dropping with an acceleration of three instead of 9.8 is because he's gripping the pole. So there's some force of the pole, you can call it whatever you want. I'll just call it FP that is acting upward. And that's a force that we're asked to solve for. So um, again, all this motion is in the Y direction. So we'll just do some of the forces in the Y direction. Upwards, we'll have that force from the pole on the firefighter. Downwards, so we subtract 655. And this will be equal to the mass of the firefighter times the acceleration. In order to plug something in for the mass, we need to be able to find what the mass is. We're given the weight of the firefighter, and we know that the weight is equal to mg. So to flip this around, we could say that the mass of the firefighter will be equal to the weight over g. So plugging that in over here, we'll have the force of the pole minus 655 is equal to the weight over g times a. Now we know everything on the right-hand side. We can go ahead and add 655 over. We have the force of the pole is equal to positive 655, because we've added it to the right side, plus the weight, which is again 655 on 9.8. The acceleration, since it's downward, is negative. So it'll be negative 3.06. The negative is important because it's going to subtract some value away from 65 and we'll get 450 newtons this is the force that the pole applies to the firefighter upward we know then that the firefighter must be pulling downward on the pole with the same magnitude but opposite direction so 450 is the first part. The second part would be the opposite. You have any questions on that one? Okay. On to the last two, which are, as usual, a little tricky. The last one's actually not too tricky. This will probably be the most difficult one. Um, so we have a crate. We're given the mass of the crate. It's on a ramp again, of course. This time, though, the force is not directed along the ramp. The force is at an angle, which is very mean of them. And um, they ask us to find the magnitude of the force that keeps the thing moving at a constant speed, or in other words, keeps us in equilibrium. So here's our sketch. Again, a rectangle on a surface. Our force that's being applied is being applied parallel to the ground. Very mean. Our other forces, as always, we have our weight going directly downward, and we have a normal force that is uh, perpendicular to the surface.
Okay, so we need to be able to uh, split this applied force up into its components, and uh, we're gonna. I'm gonna. I'm about to make some people very, very sad because we just went over how the weight is uh, uses sine for the x and cosine for the y. This applied force is unfortunately going to use our old convention of cosine for the x, sine for the y, and it's going to upset some of you. But let me just go ahead and at least diagram out what that looks like. This would be f cosine not doing what we do it is it nope. oops um, now let me sketch it out down here so here's my applied force the component that's up the ramp will be f cosine theta and the component that is directed into the ramp will be f sine of theta that comes from the geometry of comparing the triangles. Uh, since that force is applied parallel to the ground, the angle here would be the same theta as the angle of the ramp. Um, and then from there, you just use the adjacent and the opposite. I'm gonna go ahead and do the force calculation here. I ultimately need to find both the magnitude of this force and the uh, magnitude of the normal force. So I'm gonna have to do both the X and the Y summation. Let's go ahead and do the sum of the forces in the x direction. I don't know. OK. Um, uh, OK, so we'll have, uh, in the positive x direction, we have the x component of our applied force, which is f times cosine of the angle theta. In the negative x direction, we have the component of our weight directed downward. So that'll be minus the weight. Remember that the weight uses sine of theta. This block is not accelerating, so this is equal to zero. We are given all of the info here to solve for the force. So we will we could do a little bit of algebra if you want. The force will be equal to the weight times the tangent of theta, if you like, which is mg tangent theta. You'll plug in your mass, which is given. G is 9.8. Plug in your angle. And that'll give you the force. In order to find the normal force, we sum the forces in the y direction. In the positive y, I have my normal force perpendicular to the ramp. I subtract the y component of f sine theta. f sine theta. Again, not accelerating. a is equal to 0, so the force is equal to 0. And I can solve here. I'll get that the normal force is equal to f sine of theta. Since we know the force from the x, we can plug it in along with theta, and that will be your solution. Do we have any questions here? Nope, all right. I'm going to need to clear out. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I need to, one sec. Um, let me correct that. So this equation, there should also be no, there should also be a component of the weight. Oh, OK, great. There goes the whole thing. Um, in that last equation here, let me take that again, try to sum the forces in the y direction. In the positive y direction, you have the normal force. In the negative y direction, you have a component of the applied force, which is f times the sine of theta. We also have a component of the weight, which is w 
cosine theta. This is all equal to zero. Solve this for the normal force. It should be F sine theta plus the weight times cosine theta. We know the force from our answer from part A. Um, and we know W as well. Uh, you subtract F sine theta because the angle at which that force is uh, not in the y direction. So, oh, okay, I really need it. Great. Uh, that's, that's not anyone's fault, that's mine. This uh, Zoom whiteboard is having a rough time. Uh, the apply so here's your block. The applied force is applied uh, parallel to the ground. Keep in mind that our positive y direction is up and our negative y direction is down. Since this force is applied and push putting pressure on the block into the ramp, that means that the y component, which would be right here, the y component is downward or negative. That's why you'd subtract it. Okay, let me refresh the white boy here. <clears throat> okay, problem number 10. Uh, problem number 10 is an Atwood machine. Um, there is a, uh, an equation that you can use pretty explicitly um, uh, for an Atwood machine. If you want to just go look it up, you can, you can plug it in and, and, and find the solution at least to part A. Um, but let's talk a little bit about how an Atwood machine works and the intuition that it can give us for problem solving. You'll have two masses, mass one and mass two. They're connected by a rope over a pulley. One is larger than the other. The one that is larger, which in this case is mass two, is gonna wanna travel downward. The one that is smaller, mass one, will travel upward. Keeping in mind that we want to stick to, now that we're not on an incline, we want up to be positive y and down to be negative y. Sticking to that convention for the acceleration, we can say that block one will have a positive acceleration and block two will have a negative acceleration. They will have the same magnitude of the accelerations, but you'll notice that they have to go in opposite directions, so the signs on their acceleration will be different. The next thing that's going to link the two blocks together is they're connected by the same rope. Since that is the same rope, the tension has to be the same for both. They will both experience a tension upward. The thing that will be different is that they'll have different uh, weights. So block one will have weight one and block two will have weight two. Now we can sum the forces, F equals MA, on each of these blocks. Instead of doing X and Y, it's all in the Y, but now we'll do the sum of the forces for one and the sum of the forces for two. So summing the forces for block one. Looking at block one, we have a tension that's applied upwards, that's positive. We have a weight downward, so we subtract that weight downward. We'll set this equal to M times A. We have a positive A for block one. So the A on the right will be positive. Sum the forces on block two. For block two, we have a tension acting upward minus the weight downward, W2. We'll set this equal to MA. In this case, however, note that our acceleration is taken to be downward. So we need to make sure that we have a negative acceleration there in order to solve this problem. Now I can solve these, uh, both of these equations for tension um, or solve the system however I'd like to. Generally in that would problem, as we have here, you're just given the two masses of the blocks. So we wanna find an answer, a solution here that gives us the things we want in terms of masses. The problem mass is to find the acceleration, right? Both of these equations have an acceleration on the right-hand side. I don't know the tension directly. I have to find that in part B. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to solve each of these equations, taking the first one, solve them both for T. The first equation tells us that the tension is equal to W1 plus MA. 
The second equation tells us that the tension is equal to W2. Since our acceleration is negative, it'd be minus MA. I can set these two equal to each other. Keep in mind here, and I probably should have been more explicit about this, the masses in each of these will be the mass of the corresponding blocks. So in the first equation, we have the sum of the forces on block one, so we have to use mass one. And the second equation, the sum of the forces on block two should be related to mass two. Let's make sure that we keep that convention here as we go to solve these, this system of equations. We could set these both equal to each other, and we'd have W1, which would be M1G plus M1A, is equal to the second equation is W2, which would be M2G minus M2A. We'd like to group our A's together on one side. So we could add M2A to both sides, subtract M1G from both sides. And I am a bit out of room here. And now this whiteboard really does not want to get, uh, work with me. Uh, but the solution here is that the, uh, let me see if I can maybe get Oh, cool. All right, great. Uh, if you solve that equation, you get that the acceleration is, let's see, so we're going to, oh, I don't remember what I had there. I had uh, M1G plus M1A is equal to M2G minus M2A, I believe. Yeah, so that's have, what I have um, for what you wrote down earlier. What's that? Is that correct? Oh yeah, that's what. I, yeah, that was what cool. I saw from earlier. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, so yeah, so solving this for a, we'd have m two minus m one g over m um, one plus m two. That's just the solution that I was trying to get to. Um, now for part B, you need to find the tension in the cord. You can do that with either equation. I would recommend using equation one. So the sum of the forces for block one, remember, was tension minus weight one is equal to M1A. Once you have M1 and your answer from part A, you just plug that in here and solve for the tension for part B. Do we have any more questions on this one? No problem. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.